Oh my god, hi. Welcome. I am filming this late on a Friday night. I love to live on the edge, baby. Keep it saucy, keep it sexy. <laughs> Living on the edge. Hi, it's Kendall here. Um, if you're new around here, welcome. If you're not new around here, what is up, home scale biscuit? And happy Saturday. If you don't know what Saturday is, I second guessed myself. I didn't know if it was a Saturday yard. Saturdays is okay. I speak English. If you don't know what Saturday is, Saturday is when we do a little something on this channel called Bad Movies in a Beat. The series on my channel where I talk about bad movies while putting my makeup on. My lips are very dry. So a few manners of business before we get started. One, one, Stromae came out with a new album. It dropped today. It is fire. And that's all I'm going to say about that. No, I'm not getting paid for that, bitch. I wish. But I am giving him money to see him when he comes to uh, North America, apparently, in November. <laughs> you didn't ask, but I'm excited about it. Ooh. To be honest with you, I want to hurry this video up so I can go listen to it again. Two, um... What a day to be alive. Um, apparently my podcast, In Defense Of, brought to you by More Butter, after its debut is now, as of today, number eight in film and TV podcasts on Spotify in the US. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I don't know why that's so funny to me. It's just like, what? We dropped a second episode on Thursday. You can check that out on the More Butter uh, YouTube channel or of course on Spotify. This is in defense of. I just feel like if I really wanted to watch some show stopping acting performance, I would watch something that doesn't have Dwayne The Rock Johnson in it. I also appeared on uh, the Camp Counselors podcast and me and Mr. Gigi talked about Steven Seagal because I have a lot to say <laughs> in regards to Steven Seagal. He's a terrible human being. While being a illegally hired cop in Arizona, Steven Seagal drove a tank. He drove a tank into somebody's home in order to break up a cockfighting ring, ironically killing all of the roosters in the process. Again, at this point, is not technically a cop, so he's literally just a civilian driving a tank into somebody's house. <sighs> I hate to say it's interesting to go down that rabbit hole, but it is. And last manner of business before we get started, say it with me now. Bills, exactly. So we're sending it over to Admiral Kenny to secure a bag because I have yet to pay my taxes. I'm getting to it, y'all not gonna penalize me. Chill the hell out. Why, hello there, everyone. It's Adroll Candy to let you know that today's video is sponsored by Blue Land. Blue Land makes sustainable, EPA certified, ammonia free, and chlorine bleach free household products. They sell nickel sized tablets that you put into reusable bottles, all of which are color coordinated so you know which bottle to go into. You can use those to clean your home without harmful chemicals and wasteful packaging. I am a self proclaimed messy neat freak. That is a person whose house is always a mess, but I'm constantly cleaning. The girls that get it, get it, and the girls that don't, don't. With that said, I am constantly using different household products, and in the process, I've tried to use more quote unquote natural products. They suck. They don't do anything. <laughs> they're a waste of money because they're also like largely more expensive than like straight up bleach, but then if you use straight up bleach, yeah, your house will be clean, but your furniture will be discolored if it sprays on there, and if you get it anywhere, your house is gonna smell like pool water. I couldn't imagine that breathing in bleach on a regular basis is particularly healthy either. So I was skeptical because Blue Land was like, yeah, we have these natural, vegan, cruelty-free, soy-free uh, things that you can use to clean your house with these sustainable little tablets. And I was like, okay, I see you, let's go. Jolly G will occurs if it doesn't work. I've got one of their like startup kits. It comes with a bathroom cleaner, a multi-purpose cleaner, a glass and mirror spray, um, and hand soap, all of which are incredible and way, way more effective than A, any other like natural product I've ever used. And also more effective and not hurting my wallet. Because you're not paying for more packaging each time you repurchase, you can actually get a new tablet for as little as a dollar and 55 cents per tablet if you get like the bulk orders. So it's a great way to save money as well while you stock up on cleaning products that you would need anyway. It's a great way to save money, a great way to be less wasteful. And again, it actually works. All you have to do is fill up your forever bottle with warm water, put in one of your tablets, just drop it in. And then in a few minutes, Everything's ready to go. You can start spraying your house away. If you end up getting everything in a kit, it'll save you 20% on buying the products individually. So that's a good way to go if you want my opinion. And they're now shipping to the US, Canada, 
UK, Australia, and New Zealand. If you wanna check them out, that'll be linked down below and you can get 20% off of your first kit. Big thanks again to Blue Land for sponsoring today's video. Now let's get on to the debauchery. Ah, it's like filling yourself short circuit and it's so good, I love it. Ugh. Okay, so last week we um, looked at a movie that the producer of the film actually wanted me to watch. It was such a surreal situation. When we watched uh, Tina and Lori on Tubi, a waste of my time, it was terrible. <laughs> It did make for decent content though, so check that out. Also, as a side note, I feel like Tubi is slowly taking the place of Passion Flicks. Passion Flicks, my emails are open and I always accept a check. No, I don't. <laughs> Give me that Musk money. <laughs> CEO, if I'm not mistaken, is Elon Musk's sister, so hey. <laughs> Anyway, if you wanna check that out, you can check it out up above or you can check it out in the Bat Movies in a Beat playlist. And this week, Oh boy. This week we are making our long awaited return to the best and worst place on this planet Earth. Breenville, Breenland, Breenshire. We are returning to the mystical, magical world of the Neil Breen filmography. Neil Breen is a demigod. He is a walking personification of the closest thing to perfection that we humans will ever embody. And he's an incredibly humble fellow. He only played Jesus once as far as I'm aware. Basically he is a man of many hats, namely main actor in all of his independent films. All of the films that I've heard about and seen him uh, participate in all have a general theme, like a self aggrandizing tale of supernatural, hose getting Breen, who saves the world from the government. That's literally every movie I've ever seen anyone talk about from Neil Breen. They all kind of do this. It's, you know, it's very stylistically Breenian. <laughs> it's kind of enviable. Who else has their own style in that degree? Uh. The first film of his that I remember watching very early in this series, like several years ago now, was Fateful Findings. And it swiftly rose up my chart of like movies so bad that I need to have most people watch it at least once. It's an experience, right? It's like going to, to sh independent Disney. By the way, if you would like to check out that video that is now two years and several chins ago. <laughs> Damn you, COVID. I can't even blame COVID entirely. A lot of this is just like, I don't feel like doing it. But if you wanna check that out, I'll also link that down below. It's one of my, one of my favorite videos. All the way back to still living at my parents' house and having a visible collarbone. <laughs> Today, we are looking at yet another Neil Breen film. This one is his 2018 film, Twisted Pear, a film that has been uh, rightfully burning a hole in my bad movies list for again, about two years. But in fairness, I am kind of happy that I gave myself some time between Neil Breen masterpieces. Cause you know, one can only look at a masterpiece for so long before you turn to stone. Watching Neil Breen is much like staring into the sun or pouring freshly squeezed onion juice into your unsuspecting irises. It will burn you. Twisted Pair 2018 is a supposed sci-fi thriller that is starring, produced by, directed by, written by, edited by, everything by, light directed by, <laughs> Neil Breen. Again, if you're familiar with his other works, that should not surprise you. Identical twin brothers become hybrid AI, artificial intelligence in case you weren't aware yet torn in different directions to achieve justice for humanity. And that is a hilariously simplistic explanation for whatever the fuck <laughs> you're about to experience. This movie is something you cannot really prepare for. It is truly a dive into the unknown. <laughs> you must be willing to some degree to expect the unexpected. This is a brain film after all. This is one of the risks you take considering I don't plan my looks ahead of time because sometimes I look like this. Breen movies are an enigma. And if at all you think that you think that you can prepare in any way for them, that's very cute. And I love that you believe in yourself as much as you do. I am a big fan of delusional believing in oneself. I think that's how we get the world going. With that said, as a content creator, Neil Breen films present a very particular challenge for me because there's not a whole lot I can say that can rip on a Neil Breen film. It's fun in and of itself, in its essence, in its creation, it is hilarious. And if I sit here trying to make fun of something that by nature 
completely unintentionally makes fun of itself, then I'm just like stating the obvious type thing. So I've decided to alleviate that stress off of myself. I'm not even gonna try to make fun of it. One, it's a masterpiece, start there. And two, I could not add to the comedy of this myself. I am simply a vessel <laughs> to make the world more prevy of that which is Neil Breen film. So without further ado, this is Neil Breen's Twisted Pair 2018. The movie begins with stock footage of two twin boys. You can hear Breen's voice doing a voiceover, kind of telling the background of said children. The brothers are Cade and Kale, which is why would you do this to me? I'm gonna get that messed up. I just know it. Uh, but Cade is the main character. They're both Neil Breen. So. But Cade is the good guy that we'll be following through this movie. Him and his brother had a very normal upbringing. That is until they were selected by a quote force that programmed them to be humanoids with powers. They engineered them so that they could be like a fighting force. I will say as a side note, I'm even outside of Neil Breen shenanigans, I'm not a huge sci-fi person. I don't know if I've ever explicitly said this. My thing with sci-fi is that it's, it's so out of pocket in a way that's hard to follow. And this is coming from a girl who likes bullshit, obviously. I love batshit crazy things. But the thing about sci-fi is that a lot of it is just throwing like esoteric terms at you. And then you're trying to make sense of it within like a new reality that's hard enough to follow in and of itself. In a world where the Gooba Goobs are fighting the Thoroxodons, a Siloxamoron came in to save the world. And I'm sitting here like, bitch, what? But yes, they've been working for this force for years and they've been basically fighting um, crime of some sort. Heads of special forces, I guess for the military in some degrees, taking down, I guess, international crime. I don't know, they're pretty vague about it. As I'd imagine a secret like crime fighting syndicate would be, I guess. Now, Cade ends up being the brother that really does well in this job. But Kale, however, keeps failing his missions. So he ends up losing his position and having his powers stripped away from him and thus separating the brothers for years and years and years. Cade continues to work with the force while Kale uh, spirals down into a life of addiction and uh, chaos. And we'll get to that in a bit. Basically, they start their existence as two identical men who live completely separate lives in a very like pre-us retelling of what their lives would have been like if they continued with the force versus if they left it. This movie was before its time, truly. Cade goes on about how he's basically a robot now and how he has all these amazing powers, but how much he still very much so uh, thinks that technology will never replace nature. At first I thought this was gonna be a theme and then I realized it's a Neil Breen movie, so he's just saying shit. <laughs> There's like a stock video of a eagle flying <laughs> and it's some of the most kooky sh because one it's of course like everything in this movie terribly shot but like i again thought it was gonna come back to this like motif of how technology versus nature but it's literally just like nature's cool watch me pet an eagle <laughs> like speaking of scenes that got me uh, soon after that, there's this scene and there's very little that I can say to describe it to you without you just watching it. But basically it's, um, Cade helping out troops or something. Follow me. They can't hurt me. You won't get hurt. Follow me. You know, <laughs> you know, we rip on Neil Breen, some of us do. No, I don't because I'm not a lesser mortal, but truly we rip on Breen, but I wish we could all this delusionally believe in ourselves sometimes, you know? Maybe we all need a little more Breen in our lives and we'd be able to go out. He's a go-getter. He's a Mr. Make it happen. And that's where we need to realize that maybe we, we talk a lot of but there's something commendable here. He flies back to the force headquarters. We meet a blonde woman who is supposedly the head of the force. Um, I guess she has some kind of presidential CEO position and she gives Cade his new mission, 
which is something vaguely in regards to programmable virtual reality, the corrupt version. Now, again, I'm not a huge sci-fi person because of this issue of just like the blah, 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 info dump thing. But this movie <laughs> does it in such a way that theoretically I shouldn't be confused, but I am because they say, they spell out like, one clause or one sentence increments on what is happening. We have evidence of the largest cyber and terror attacks ever planned. Programmable DNA. We are on the verge of mind hacking. Programmable matter. We will all be connected telepathically. And I was so taken aback by just the structure of the scene that I don't, I didn't even retain any information. But from what I gather, something, you know, is going on with technology and companies and controlling DNA. Next scene, we jump into Cade accidentally bumping into a woman. It's my no, fault, no. really. Me I apologize. Leave me alone. Let me make leave it up alone. to you. No. I'll take you out to dinner. Leave me alone. Leave I have me. a boyfriend. Let's have Get it. Out of my Let's have it. And then at the end of the scene, I always sit there and think, like, who? Where are you finding people to participate in these movies? Is the thing that's running me ragged. Like, how how did you get people to play along? And then in a really weird out of nowhere moment, uh, essay trigger warning, uh, Cade breaks into her home and tries to attack her. I'll teach you to ignore me. You were supposed to meet me at eight. <laughs> Bitch. Before you get concerned, he's not a monster. This apparently is a very intricate, long drawn out sexual role play thing that him and his girlfriend like to do. Why we as the audience had to be dragged along for that beats me. Imagine buying breakaway glass for a dramatic nut. Meanwhile, the twin, Kale is going about justice in his own way. He's kidnapping presumably rich and important men and keeping them in a basement chained up and uh, incrementally shooting them in places that are non-fatal so that he can just make them feel really bad about being corrupt men. One, very off-putting to watch because you don't know what's happening at first. It just sounds like vague men moaning in a dark room. <laughs> And then when you actually see it, you realize that this is very, you know, Neil Breedy and he does these like large political statements that aren't particularly well flushed out. It's just like corrupt people, corruption, end it now. The, the message itself feels staunchly anti-capitalist. There is an element of it that still feels very, um, I don't know, like the, the methodology of just like, let's just, kidnap people and shoot them feels very January 6th, you know what I mean? Insurrectionist, I don't know. You know, I'm not 100% sure what his political statements are, which is funny considering every single movie he makes is a political statement. <laughs> Who looks more stupid, Neil Breen or me trying to really unpack what his political leanings are? <laughs> I mean, in fairness, all of his movies are just like, government, stop it. <laughs> Stop doing the things you do. And it's like, sure, but like what? <laughs> Cause corruption, end it now. Bad things, over they are. I don't know why I'm acting like this, any film for Neil Breen isn't just like a collective hallucination anyway, so. Kale is very much so pro vigilante takedown of the government, so much so that he's like, again, kidnapping like 15 rich, important corrupt men at a time. They were not able to find him because he was able to re-encrypt his DNA or something. Like they weren't able to find his crimes. Kate and his girlfriend make out and it is disgusting, but I do feel like, uh, Another theme of Neil Breen movies is that he just, I think he partially makes them solely to make out with pretty women. I hear the food is spectacular. The service is impeccable. It's just friggin' invisible. <laughs> <laughs> you see what I mean? Like, I don't have anything to add to that. Finally, Cade and Kale see each other again. They are reunited after years of being apart. Um, Cade is good, quote unquote. Kale is bad um, and has a beard. It's hilarious because obviously it's like full green screen. The scene is giving very 
first Mortal Kombat um, and they never directly look at each other and it's just really funny. It's horrible. He he pets him much like he does the eagle. <laughs> Later, we end up seeing more of Kale's life. He is uh, addicted as well as his partner to drugs and alcohol. Um, they have a physical altercation over said drugs. And though this is supposed to be a very serious scene, presumably about domestic violence, they put like these cartoon sound effects over it. Oh my God. <laughs> I don't even want you anymore. All I want is the drugs and the money. At least she's honest. At least she's straightforward. I wish more of us were more upfront with our intentions. But knowing Neil Breen, he still thinks this is like a, like a serious scene. So I don't, I, 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 part of me wants to like accuse him of trying to make light of directed violence, but I think he genuinely thought he was doing like a hard hitting scene. So I don't even know how to make sense of anything. So fine, whatever. Also, I think this is another reoccurring theme with Breen movies is that there's always like a wife with a pill problem, <laughs> or at least from the last, I've only seen two movies in full. So uh, that was also in Faithful Finding. So I don't know if that's gonna be one of the pillars of his art. So we finally meet the bad guy. Mind you, we've had no mention of a specific bad guy this entire movie, but his name is, oh boy, C-U-Z-Z-X, Kuz. He says it throughout the movie, but I, I don't know how we narrow it down to him. He hasn't really been mentioned this entire movie, but it's just like you see a bad guy wearing a bunch of jewels and, and fondling diamonds in a cup and a chalice. So it's like, yeah, sure, bad guy. Cartoonishly hedonistic. <laughs> It's a brain movie, why am I? <laughs> but we don't really know what he does. We just vaguely know that he uses technology for bad things. And so Cade prepares to take down his laboratory mainly um, at first and then take him down later. I don't need to carry a weapon. Is he gonna say I am the weapon? I am the weapon. Fuck. <laughs> He is able to meet with who has a pet hot woman with telepathic abilities. We don't learn more about that, but yeah. And they are able to negotiate. We find out that has the voice of a Scooby-Doo villain. Oh, so you come highly recommended. And eventually Cade gets the center of the operation without weapons or an army something that he is really big on reminding us that he doesn't need. <laughs> Meanwhile, Kale shoots the rich guys that have been trapped up in that unspecified basement area. And then we also show him fighting with his partner again afterwards, this time to a remix. We're done. I'm done with you. We're done. We're done. We're done. I'm done with you. Do not ask me questions. Like I know what's going on either. I'm tired. Truly, I'm just trying to finish so I can go listen to Stromai and just live my life, okay? <laughs> and then Cade blows up Kungsa's lab. And after this, whatever little structure this movie had just falls apart, it disintegrates in a way that's really difficult to explain without viewing the movie. Honestly, this is definitely a movie I should have done reaction style. There's just a lot going on and none of it makes sense even if you watch the movie. <laughs> but basically there is this hilarious tussle between Kale's girlfriend and Cade because she thought he was Kale and that he had just shaved his face. I never had a beard. What? What are you talking I've about? I've never had a beard. Cade's girlfriend sees them hugging and thinks that he's cheating on her. Kale starts yelling at a random black man, screaming that he betrayed us. And up until this point, I don't think we've seen this man the entire movie. Presumably he was another one of the supernatural humanoids, but because we don't have that like background information, it just seems like he's just yelling at a random black dude. You betrayed us. He ends up coming home to find out that his girlfriend is on the bad guy's side and they do like a like a standoff, like I have to shoot you, Cade. And he's like, I have to shoot you. And so he shoots her. <laughs> they both shoot each other, but for some reason only she got shot, <laughs> even though they were like three feet away from each other. The corrupt people die in that cellar that Kale was keeping them in and he just, walks away, I guess that's, and that's the end. That's the end of that. Then in the purple hue of the afterlife, Cade reunites with his girlfriend again after he murdered her, <laughs> even though this is very much so giving supernatural YA 
I was abusive the entire relationship, but at least we reunite in the afterlife. He uh, says a lot more sci-fi e stuff, bunch of jargon, and I'm confused the whole time. And and that uh, is ultimately the movie. I don't know. I. Off the top of my head, I don't recall whether or not Kale and Cade reunite. I don't know how Cade got to the afterlife because he didn't die, as far as we know. He kind of like ends the movie on a line that's something along the lines of like, everyone deserves to be loved and to love and to have peace. Everyone has the right to love and peace. I'll be right <laughs> like yeah <laughs> sure <laughs> i don't know this movie is just comedic perfection in a way that i don't feel i can add anything to you've done it again brain what can i say if you haven't seen the movie before if you've never heard of anything from neil brain uh, personally, I prefer Fateful Findings over this movie. That one, again, I've done a video on, but both are an experience to behold. And that that is true. Uh, anyway, that's all for today, folks. If you like this video, feel free to like this video. If you have other bad movies that you'd like me to check out, feel free to put them down in the comment section. Feel free to check out the podcast over on More Butter. And I will see you guys next time.